It is indeed my pleasure to introduce our two-person panel uh, discussion on the topic titled, A Conversation on K-12 Education in Kansas. Our panel members are Kevin McWhorter, he's a member of the Goddard USD 259 Board of Education, and Dave Trobert, President of the Kansas Policy Institute. I want to extend the Pachyderm Club's special thanks to both uh, presenters for participating in today's discussion. Please join me in giving Kevin McWhorter and Dave Trobert a warm Pachyderm Club welcome. welcome. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I will, I'll try to stay close to the microphone. You're going to take time away from saying thank you and welcome? Wow, she's tough. She is tough. Um, let, me, let me start by, uh, so I might go 30 seconds over. But uh, I want to thank everyone for this invitation. And I also want to thank Kevin for agreeing to do this. Uh, unfortunately, these kinds of open public discussions from different viewpoints are, are rarities in Kansas. It shouldn't be, but, but they are. Uh, and, and to Pachyderm, uh, you know, as a uh, former resident of Sedgwick County and a current resident of Johnson County, I can tell you we really wish we had this in Johnson County. This is clearly the best venue in Sedgwick County. I think it might be the best venue in the state. You really have a treasure here in the ability to hear so many different viewpoints here at, at the uh, Pachyderm. I want to spend my time today talking about what we think is the, the most serious challenging challenge facing Kansas public education, and it's not finance. It's student achievement. And it's, frankly, the lack of honesty that we have about what goes on in student achievement in Kansas. And I hope I get this button right. Yep. So we're all familiar with the old Hans Christian Andersen tale about the emperor's new clothes. The weaver, two weavers convince uh, the emperor that they can put together this wondrous new outfit, wardrobe, uh, and only the people who are noble and worthy can see them this magic material. And we all know, everybody knows the story, the emperor goes out parading the clothes and everybody knows he's not wearing anything, but nobody wants to say anything because they don't want to be seen as not noble, not worthy. In Kansas, you ask the college professors, you ask the community college professors, ask employers, honestly, are, are the kids coming out of Kansas schools really ready for college and career? And they'll tell you no. Some are, certainly. And it's not to say things are bad. This is not an attack. But we have to be honest if we're going to try to move forward. Uh, and, and so I just want to share some of the facts here with you. ACT, only 32% of Kansas high school graduates are considered college ready in English, reading, math, and science. The National Assessment of Educational Progress, fourth grade students, low income kids, only 20% are proficient in reading. Only 27% of them are proficient in math. The, lo the fourth graders who are not low income, it's 54% proficient in reading and 58% proficient in math. And you can see even on our own state assessments, the percentage of children who are, and these are um, number of kids who are uh, considered to be on track for college readiness. Uh, they're very, very low numbers. I'm not saying that's anyone's fault. That's just the reality. Here's some more of the emperor's tales. This slide from the Department of Education <coughs> says Kansas leads the nation, or leads the world, in the success of Kansas students. We don't lead the world. We don't even lead the nation. We have to be honest about these things. Here's the performance. These are the national rankings of Kansas. And you can see that there's, there's a few in the teens, but overall, whether it's the National Assessment of Education or it's the ACT, overall Kansas is about in the middle. And we're about in the middle in a nation that just doesn't do very well. This slide is from a, a study that was done on the average performance on international student achievement. The United States came in 29th. We have to be honest about where things are. So what's the trajectory we're on? Are we close to getting where we want to be? This is the ACT and, and the uh, NAEP scores. Based on the ten, what's happened over the last 10 years, if that same pace continues, 
It's going to take centuries to close the achievement gaps that can be closed. At the same 10-year pace, not all of those gaps could ever be closed. And when they do, for example, the fourth grade kids, if we were able to close the achievement gap on proficiency level, proficiency level they'd be all of 54% proficient. The question there is, is that even acceptable? Here's some examples for you, and this is all, and there's handouts on your uh, table uh, if you want to see this. Uh, they're black and white, but you can see. This slide shows some of the local area achievement. And so, for example, on the, and boy, mine is really slow, really light. You can see on the far right side of each uh, slide, one of these is for English language arts and the other is for math. These are the percentages of 10th graders who are on track to be college ready in English language arts and in math. And they're, they're very unacceptably low. Now this looks different from what you've seen in the past. This is a new state assessment. This is a more honest picture of what has been going on for a very long time in Kansas. And by the way, Kansas is no different than pretty much the rest of the nation. These issues are persistent. Now all this is going on at the same time that funding has gone up exponentially in Kansas. This is a picture with and without CAPERS spending over the life cycle of the old school finance formula. Per pupil spending is up 45% above inflation if you count CAPERS, and even the Supreme Court says it has to count, but even if you take it all out, we're still 40% above inflation over the period of that old school funding system and everything we've done has brought us to where we are on student achievement. Now some people I know believe that there is a correlation between spending more money and achieving more. But I want to talk about this just very briefly. Even the Kansas Legislative Research Department says that cannot be proven. And that's only talking about correlation. Even the people who say they do find a correlation are very clear if you ask the question correctly, they'll tell you that doesn't mean there's causation. That's a separate matter. We're not saying that there is a, a causation. We just think there's a correlation. And we went through this, uh, the Kansas uh, Association of School Boards representative, I went through this for the legislature in a committee hearing recently. And we refuted pretty much every single point in their presentation where they found correlation. And Mr. Tallman had the opportunity to refute what we were saying, and, and he didn't offer anything to say, well, that's not true. There, it's just not there. So and I'm going to skip through a couple of things here. That's a, a Cato picture. I'm down to 40 seconds here. Let me close by saying this. We want to focus on improving the outcomes in Kansas, and that has to start with we have to come to grips with where things are now. And part of that has to be, this is not about casting blame. This is not saying schools did anything wrong, teachers did anything wrong, legislators did. We think we should take the approach that no one's to blame for where we are, but we're all responsible for getting this fixed. And just doing more of the same, harder, isn't going to change anything. Everything we've done to this point has gotten us to where we are. Student interests have to become first. That has to be the guide star, not what we think is baby best for the community or the adults or the institutions. And it's not that they don't matter, but if students don't come first in every decision, then they're not first. Thank you. Kevin McWhorter. Welcome. Appreciate being here. This is uh, definitely outside of my pay scale, I can tell you for sure. I appreciate uh, what Mr. Trebert also indicated. Uh, we will agree that we all want what is best for the students in the state of Kansas. We want to do exactly what is in their business, best interest, and we want to make sure that they graduate from our K-12 education schools ready for success in life. Thank you. But one thing I do need to start out with, and it wasn't what I was going to do, but I'm going to read this to you, and it says, particularly in light of the overwhelming evidence that Kansas students are excelling, the, legislative reasonably, the legislature reasonably 
concluded that it has made suitable for provision for the financing of the state's education interest. This is the state arguing before the Supreme Court in a written brief three months ago. So I think that we're all going to agree that there is uh, definitely uh, a disagreement as to what success looks like and what the state is providing to make that success a reality for our kids. My name is Kevin McWhorter and I wear many hats. Uh, I'm a taxpayer, I'm a voter, I'm a scoreboard member, and I've also been, as John indicated, a businessman here in the city of Wichita for the last 39 years. I'm also a lifetime member of the Republican Party, and I'm proud to say that. Many incorrectly believe that the school board members only want more money to operate schools. That is not true. I am responsible to the needs and interests of the voters who elect me. They include taxpayers, property owners, and the business owners of the students of my district. Six other school board members that I am proud to serve with and I have an obligation to balance the needs of these along with the parents, staff, and students of 5,700 kids in the Goddard School District. We look at issues that affect schools from many different points of view. Every decision we make is scrutinized by how it affects kids. And there are many things that I am not. I am not a registered uh, paid political lobbyist. I'm, I do not have an agenda here today except to provide the best learning opportunity for kids. That's it. There are 2,002 school board members serving the needs of 286 districts in our state. Not a one of us gets a paycheck. Not a one of us gets a pension. We are unpaid volunteers trying to make our state a better place to successfully raise a family and give our children the opportunity to receive the best public education possible. In the next hour, I have no doubt that you will hear conflicting information regarding the state of K-12 education in Kansas. And we've already started. I will promise to tell you what I know and I will also tell you if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know, because I don't know at all. But I will be honest about all of that. One thing that you will not question when you leave here today is what I believe and the passion I have for the education not only of the kids of Goddard, but for the other 470,000 kids in the state of Kansas. In 2005, a little history, I was asked by the current superintendent of the Goddard Schools at that time to run for the Board of Education, as he understood that I had 28 years at that time of municipal bond finance in the state of Kansas. The Goddard District was severely overcrowded and was in dire need of a long-term expansion plan that would require additional buildings for all grade levels, including an additional high school. I was asked, if elected, to assist in the implementation of the plan, which included educating our voters of the need of a very large bond issue, and if passed, working with the district financial advisors, architects, and the companies that would ultimately be hired to build the buildings, and finally to redesign boundaries for our new schools. I was elected, the bond was passed, the buildings were built, and they came in at or under budget, and the boundaries were redrawn. The Goddard District has had student growth for 31 consecutive years, and I'm not aware of any other district in the state that can make that claim. We do have challenges because of growth. These were the first four years of my uh, being a member of the board. When the building projects were essentially completed, I assumed that the normal powder pattern of a board member uh, would come around, but I was wrong. It's now mid-2009 and our country is in the worst recession since the Great Depression. State revenues were reduced by $600 million, $690 million over the 30-month period of the Great Recession. The governor and legislature had no choice but to cut K-12 funding during the period. Boards of education were told that once the recovery commenced, cuts would be restored and that would be to come in, become in compliance with the Montoy litigation case of 2005. The economy began to recover and state revenues increased, but the restoration of the cuts did not. We began talking regularly to the seven state representatives and the two state senators who have voters in our district, and we spent a significant amount of time educating our legislators as to the negative long-term impact to our district from these cuts. During that period of time, we raised fees on our students and parents, 
We raised property taxes and we invaded cash reserves to keep the cuts as far away from the kids as possible, as far away from the classroom as we could. And we were successful doing that for a number of years, but at some point we were not able to do that any longer and we ended up having to cut some programs and lay off people. A new governor was elected and took office in 2011. He was elected as a self-proclaimed pro-education governor. However, instead of restoring cuts, he went a different direction with tax policy, which resulted in massive state revenue reductions. The decrease in state revenues the first year of the tax cuts was $711 million, or $21 million more than all of the reductions in revenues from the Great Recession over a 30-month period. His claims of immediate tax recovery from the tens of thousands of new jobs moving into the state and the new residents that would come with them did not occur. Today, five years later, we have evolved from a shot of adrenaline to the heart to a real live experiment to these things can take up to 10 years and we need to be patient. I would tell you that 470,000 K-12 students can no longer afford to be patient. <laughs> In three months, I will be handling, handing diplomas to 400 graduating seniors in the Goddard School District. It saddens me to know that this class, in this class, not once in the 13 years that they attended K-12 education in Kansas did they ever receive all of the resources that the state constitution promised them. I've had two heroes in my life. One was my grandfather, who was the best man at my wedding. He died eight years ago, and I miss him every day. The other was my eighth grade English teacher 44 years ago when I was in Southern California. I was uh, 13 years old, uh, and I was hanging out with the wrong crowd, and uh, he took me aside, told me that I had promise, he believed in me, and that I could become a successful citizen. His name is Wayne Craythorn. I call him every day, I'm sorry, every, every week, and have for the last 44 years. The Goddard Board of Education is proud of the success of our students. We respect and admire the dedication and professionalism of our teachers and staff, and we collaborate with other boards of education across the state in the name of better education for all students. We are not highly immoral. We are not highly inefficient. We do what we can, and we try to do the best job we can. Thank you. Now we move into the two minute response time. Let's Dave first and Kevin second, please. Thanks, John. Um, it's, um, let, let's try to clear up some differences of opinion here or if, see if there are any. Um, Kevin, let me ask you a question. Uh, I, I showed a couple of slides of uh, student achievement. Uh, ACT, NAEP proficiency, state assessment. Are those numbers accurate? I don't know. Okay. I know okay. If okay. You a, if you want to come up with a conclusion, there are so many different variable facts, you can probably come up to where you need Okay. To he said he doesn't know. So let me, let me say this way. And okay, so he's not familiar with whether or not those are accurate. So let me ask you this. Let's, let's assume for now that they're accurate. 32% college ready. 27% uh, of low-income kids proficient in math um, in fourth grade. Let's assume those are accurate. Are those acceptable? If they're accurate, they're not acceptable. Okay. Now, you said pretty clearly in a number of different ways that you don't think that, in fact, I think you said, if I wrote this down right, over the 13 years of kids who are going to be graduating, they never had the resources they needed. How much is enough? There's not a dollar figure. Do you want me to come up or what do you want me to do? Sure, come on up. Come on up. Sure. Okay, great. My answer to that question would be that there is and has been litigation in this state for a number of decades that they came to conclusions. The plaintiff said that the state Supreme Court and the defendants, which was the state of Kansas, and there was a plan that was put into place. And it was basically built upon base state aid. And my response to your question 
would be that my comment about 13 years and not the resources promised meant that the base state aid, as it was supposed to be in each fiscal year, was never at that level. Okay. My question was... Well, he took half of it. All right. Well, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go back into it. Okay. It's my interpretation that by asking him a question, you yielded part of your time. Okay. All right. So am I asking a question or what am I doing? This is your two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, um, uh, Dave has a lot of figures and facts, I get that. And a lot of that information comes from various sources, not just one. It would be really nice if we could all look at the same information and believe the same information, and then we could come up with conclusions that we could look at from two different angles and see what needs to be done. The only one thing that I do wanna point out that Dave did mention, and accurately so in his initial presentation, was the 40% increase of funding without different outcomes or something to that effect. I want to point out that the 40% increase was based upon the Montoy settlement case in 2005 when the legislature went back into special session and provided more finance and resources to the school districts based upon that settlement of the litigation at the time. They did start to put more money in, and that's where a lot of this increase that we're talking about occurred from. But then the Great Recession came about, cuts were reinstated, and we never got to the point where the base state aid was supposed to be in fiscal years 07, 8, 9, 10, and so on. Now we don't have base state anymore because we don't have the 1992 funding mechanism that was put in place by the legislature at that time. So, I would say to you that when you look at all of this increase of money that has been implemented, it's not all operational, and some of that was because of litigation settlement. Thank you. Okay. Let's, let's move now to Q&A. Okay. So, if you're new to Packet Room Club or visiting today, I'll let you know. Both of our speakers. Q&A. And we do this at the end of every packet room club. We let our members ask questions first, and if there's time at the end, guests are welcome to ask a question. Keep it to a question, and uh, that will allow us to get the most out of our program today. Okay, gentlemen, here's a question really for both of you. If we were to restore 100% of the funding that was cut for the Obama recession, and if we were to give you an increase in funding to the level that you want or that you think is necessary, keeping in mind the LLC rollback gets you $139 million, how do you pay for the rest of what you want, what you feel you need? You want to go first? Because he's. Yeah, he really is. He's the $139 million that was put into, uh, it was uh, directed from the state Supreme Court to satisfy the equity part of the Gannon lawsuit. $101 million of that went to property tax reduction. We didn't get new money. There wasn't any new money. The Supreme Court said the state owes that, not the local taxpayers. They made the state pay. Local taxpayers got the rebate. States didn't get any more, or uh, school districts didn't get any more money. The 39 million that he mentions, the other 38 million for a total of 139, that was capital outlay. And I would say to you that every school district in this state that qualified for capital outlay for five years got nothing. And for the Goddard School District, that five years of capital outlay where we got nothing decreased our revenues to run our schools if I recall, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $3.6 million. So I'm not sure I, answered, I understand all your questions, so correct me if, I, if I'm wrong here, but um, where would the money come from if, if everything, if basically if the schools got everything they wanted? Uh, well, a lot of places. Um, 
It, it comes from within school districts and from within the state operations because none of them are even close to efficient. None of them. Alvarez and Marcel just did a, uh, introduced an efficiency study of state government which included some things for K-12. It was by no means comprehensive. Uh, and they came up with to over $2 billion in savings over a five-year period for the state. Some of that was for schools. School districts have made some changes, certainly, and I don't doubt that they're working hard to try to be efficient, but the very structure of the whole system is horribly inefficient. We have 286 school districts, so we have 286 transportation systems and accounting systems and payroll systems and everything is duplicated almost 286 times. No matter what they try to do internally, there's still horrible inefficiencies within government, within schools everywhere. So a lot of the money to do whatever we want to do can come from just operating how we, everything we do a lot better. And it's not about quality. It's not about sacrificing quality. It's about uh, better service, better price, getting the same or better quality service at a better price. Um, Mr. McWhorter, you mentioned you have 5,700 students out of Goddard in the Goddard District. Can you give me a rough idea of what the total budget is for uh, the Goddard School District and, and how much of that is coming from the state? And if the state's not properly funding it, how much more the state would need to fund to be able to become, I think the magic word is suitable? Thank you. In one of these bags, I do have that information. <laughs> Let me see if I can go off memory. The uh, Goddard School District budget for 2015 is right at $61 million. Uh, how much comes from the state? I would have to get the numbers. I don't know off the top of my head. As far, what was the remaining part of your question? Depending upon how much the state was funding, how much more would the state need to fund to become suitable? I think it's a magic legal word out there. Mm. Uh, you know, I think it goes back to the comment I had just a moment ago. It's not a set number for me, uh, but there was a litigation settlement that created the dollars that the state and through all taxes collected would be responsible to provide in each fiscal year to do the job that the state wants the school districts to do. Okay, but we, we haven't been at that number in a long time. And so we make cuts, we, we cut programs, uh, we make our staff do things that they shouldn't have to do to cover for the other types of areas that we've had to cut. This last year, as a matter of fact, we cut 18 uh, custodial positions and 13 and a half teaching positions because the block grant froze our money at previous levels, even though we have 110 more kids than we had the year before. It's a challenge. Yeah. Is that a question? Wait, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah real, really quickly, let me, let me jump in there. The answer, uh, Commissioner, is about 44 million of the 62 comes from the state. Uh, the balance comes from, uh, state, uh, from local efforts and, and federal. Uh, in your handout, you can also see there's a breakout uh, for Goddard and several other local school districts that shows for example, the total spending over the last 10 years on a per pupil basis for Goddard is up 45 percent. Uh, and this is per pupil, so we're accounting for enrollment changes. Inflation was 21 percent over that period. Um, on, on this matter of how much and what the state, because we keep kind of going back to uh, the, the court decisions, um, that's still pending. And what, what hasn't been brought out here, and frankly hasn't been brought out much in the media, is that the that base state aid decision and what the lower court is looking at is in defiance of the state Supreme Court's ruling in 2014. The state Supreme Court said, because everything is based on that old Augenblick and Myers cost study, which came up with base state aid, the state Supreme Court in March 2014 said they basically walked away from that study. They said it is more akin to estimates than the certainties the lower court envisions. That's out the window. Now, the lower court continues to defy the state Supreme Court. Base state aid is out the window, which is based on that old Augenblick and Myers cost study, which comes back to how much do schools need? We really don't know. No one in Kansas knows to this day how much schools need to achieve outcomes and also use, make efficient use of your money. Right, 
Yes, are you uh, for a government sponsored or government financed school choice? I think that every parent in this state should have school choice. As a parent, if I want to go to public or my kids to public education, great. If I want them to go to parochial, great. A magnet, fine. For profit charter, fine. Not for profit charter, fine. But the state doesn't pay for that. The state is obligated to pay for public education. And when you go into the for profit charter and you don't have the uh, accountability and transparency that you have in public education, I don't understand where the state thinks that that's in the best interest of the taxpayer at all. There are many states that have public financed school choice for charter schools. Every one of those states, and you're reading, well, last week we saw the state of Missouri is suing a charter school in Kansas City, Missouri for $3.7 million. They don't have the money. They don't know where the money went. All they know is, is that the charter school falsified attendance documents to the state. We don't want that here. And our Constitution states that public financed money will go to finance public education. Actually, I disagree with a good bit of that. First of all, um, the Constitution charges the legislature with making suitable provision for the educational interests of the state. It doesn't specify that it can only go to public education. What are the educational interests of the state? To me, that's the kids. It's the kids. It's not the buildings. It's not the teachers. It's the kids. And you look at these accurate numbers, and they are accurate because they come from NAEP, they come from the state assessment, they come from ACT. The reason that there's a lot of push for school choice in Kansas and across this country is because those numbers are so low and they're not getting better. So, yes, we definitely support school choice, whether that be with the tax credit scholarship we have for low-income kids, public charter schools. Kansas has the worst public charter school law in the country. We need to change those things. We should fund students, not institutions. The student outcome is what matters. And if, that, if the parent thinks they can get a better education for their child, they should be able to take that money and go wherever they are going to get because it's about the student, it's not about the institution. Yeah, I've always heard that when it comes to school financing, it's the Constitution. It's the Constitution. We can't change anything because of, the, because of the Constitution. So I went to the Constitution. And the only thing I see excluded from financing by the state government is a religious school. It's the only thing excluded. Other than that, what we call private schools would be financeable. The thing I is, is public, government-run schools? Yeah, is government, public-run schools? Or is it schools that the public can attend? The, the on, on the first part, one of the parts where you're talking about, the Constitution does say that you cannot have, uh, religious c sectors cannot control. Public, uh, school choice, though, does not, give money to the schools, it gives money to the parents. And so the courts have held that parents are, if the parent chooses to take that money, whether it's a scholarship or an education savings account or whatever, and send that to, a, use that to go to a religious school, that is fine with the courts. That does not violate the Constitution. That's a separate matter. So and if you, could you refresh me on the other part of your question? Well, it was just a the only thing prohibited from public financing was religious schools. So therefore, public would mean government-run schools or private schools that the public can attend. Of course, it, it does. I mean, and again, the Constitution is about the edu funding the suitable provision for the educational interests of the state. That's, that's not just anything specific. There is a prohibition on giving government money to the schools, but not to giving it to parents. 
and letting them decide what is the best opportunity for their kids. I think it's interesting that uh, last year was the first year of the um, <coughs> law that was put into effect for tax credits. This year, and it was designed uh, for a 70% tax credit, and then uh, it was for low-income kids. This year, that's going to be taken off the table. You're going to have 100% tax credits, and you're going to have a 250% of uh, whatever the national um, low-income threshold is. And you're also going to see tax credits from individuals that can go to anywhere they want. That's how lawsuits get started. I'm not telling you that that's what I think should happen, but there are groups out there when taxpayer money, and if it's not going to the state and you get a 100% tax credit, what the state is telling you is you can either give us your, make up a number, $5,000 of tax liability, or you can donate that to a person who is going to go to, in this case, maybe a religious organization. Separation of church and state. I've heard that somewhere. I think that that is going to be a problem that the legislature is going to have to solve or somebody is going to come out and make it an issue. And I do worry about that because that's not the type of business that we need to be in. Recently, the Wichita Eagle reported that there is a, re uh, a resegregation of schools since the cessation of busing for integration purposes. Do you believe this resegregation is going to have a negative or positive impact on student achievement? And if it does have a negative impact, uh, uh, is it reasonable to have uh, the cost for busing to establish that integration of schools? You want to go first? I'm really not the person to have an opinion about that. Uh, in Goddard, we do not have any type of busing issues that would have an effect for us that you're referring to. So I would say, as I said before, if I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. On that one, I don't know. You know that if you read the, go all the way through that article in the Eagle, it, it was interesting because it's, it's kind of a, um, a little bit of a misleading label that was applied to it. Um, a school that is 60 percent of one race is determined to be single race. I don't know if that's common core math or not, <laughs> but, but, but we don't have what that, art, that article seemed to imply. If you read the headlines, it seemed to imply, well, we've got black schools and white schools and Hispanic schools, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. We don't have resegregation. That article, the way, sometimes the way headlines get attached to stories, it can give different impressions. We don't have that. You go ask, I mean, right here in Wichita, I mean, you find, try to find a school that's, I mean, you'll find some that are more predominant one or the other, but uh, as far as, is busing the answer? No, uh, absolutely not. First of all, uh, because in my 25 seconds left, I'll try to just sum this up very quickly. Um, that's not student focused. What is best interest for the child? We have to get them to learn. And moving them to a different school might make some of the adults feel better, but it's not going to change how these kids learn. Right back here, next question. Oh, this is a question to both of you, I think. Uh, on a national basis, much of our debate, we hear the debate, uh, and the candidates talking about uh, revolves around our immigration policy. And if I understand correctly, we take in over a million people a year into our country, which is more than the rest of the world combined, legally. On top of that, we have a number of illegal immigrants and now refugees coming to this country. So I, my question revolves, and this is talk about the results, our education results. We have now kids coming into our school system that don't have the background that our kids had growing up in America. They have a whole cultural issue, never mind question. the language issue. So the question is, what impact is that going to have on the financial needs that our, our school districts are going to need to go forward? Well, certainly if you bring in more and more students, 
who can't speak English, for example, uh, or came from a country where they're even farther behind in the world uh, than, than the United States is, then they're coming in with some more challenges, and that would increase costs. Um, but on your other point, uh, talking about kids coming in and how this affects achievement, um, I would not say that that's had any impact on our overall achievement. I mean, just look at the, you know, if you want to forget the kids who are low income, look at the kids who are not low income. Half of them are proficient. Half. That's always been the case. So it's, it's not, there's other issues, but I don't want us to get the impression that, well, it's, it's this factor or it's that factor that is causing our achievement levels to be where they are. They are where they are and have been for a very, very long time. I'm not going to speak to achievement, but I will tell you the challenges that a school district faces when they do have those type of issues. 1977, I graduated from Goddard High School, and there were two languages spoke. There was English and there was mine, because I was from California and I was the outside kid. There wasn't anybody else. Today, we have 47 different languages in our school system. English is second language to 47 different languages. It is a challenge. And of course, we, as a public school system, do not have the latitude when a child comes to our schools to turn them away. All they have to do is provide proof that they are a resident in our school district boundaries. We have no choice but to accept those kids and educate them to the best that we can. And if this child doesn't speak a language that we have a para that speaks, we have to go out and hire one. And that costs money. And one of the things that I think everybody in this room is going to agree upon is the fact that over the last 15, 20 years, challenges to school districts because of immigration are significant. And that is not something that I see going away anytime soon. But when a child comes to our district, they live in the district, they prove they do, they're in the doors. There's been talk about accountability and transparency of Kansas schools. I am, um, and Kansas schools have generally said, look at these scores on the Kansas State test. They are very high. Our students do very well. But over the decades, the United States Department of Education has compared the strengths of each state's assessment standards to a common standard, the NAEP test. And Kansas, year after year, turned out to have some of the least rigorous, the weakest standards amongst uh, the states, some very near the very bottom. That's not how Kansas students score. It's the system that the State Board of Education adopted to assess our students. Well, this year we have some better standards and the Department of Education has admitted that the new standards are more rigorous than the old ones. So what is it, is it accountable, accountable to say for all these years that Kansas students do well when we have standards that were very weak compared to other states? Yeah, Bob's talking about the uh, uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, or the U.S. Department of Education's review of state standards. And yes, between 2002 and 2013, which was the last year reported for the old standards, uh, it did appear to Kansas residents that we had very high achievement, very high proficiency levels in the 80s and so forth for kids in Kansas. But that was only because, as Bob pointed out, Kansas had some of the lowest standards in the nation on performance, according to the U.S. Department of Education. I'll give you an example. It's like saying, we had A's, but our scale for A was 70 to 100, and the rest of the country was 90 to 100. You can't compare performance when you don't have the same performance standards. And so what we're seeing now is more like what we used to see before the State Department of Ed and the State Board of Ed reduced the performance standards in 2002 and again in 2006. Prior to that, what you saw in the NAEP, those scores I showed you, proficiency levels in the 30s and the 40s, that's what we saw back then until they reduced the performance standards. In this area, I obviously depend upon the uh, State Board of Education to provide the rigorous curriculum that 
students will be able to take test upon and be able to compare apples to apples instead of apples to oranges. So, you know, as far as a specific question to me about uh, nationwide, I'm not going to have the expertise to be able to to give you an answer that I think you're going to to want to see. Okay. This will be our last question before. Yeah. Could I? Could I just real quickly? There's both of us probably should have mentioned this. There's two standards. What Kevin was talking about was curriculum. That's what you're supposed to know. That's the academic standard. That's separate. Kansas didn't have low academic standards. It was the performance standard that was low that Mr. Weeks was talking about. Okay, last question. What uh, extent? Excuse, excuse okay. me. Uh, Kevin has rebuttal time to what Dave just said. I think part of the confusion in talking about test scores is whether or not you are comparing to comprehension and performance, and those are two definite, district, different, distinct issues. And sometimes they get put together as though they're the same thing, and they're not. To what extent has education funding in Kansas been cut? Good. Mm. Education funding in Kansas, if we have to go back to uh, the previous funding mechanism that was put into place in 1992 by the legislature, which interestingly enough everybody now thinks was terribly complicated, but you know, I don't think it really was. I think it, I think the funding formula just wasn't funded properly, but that's another issue. Uh, when we went to the block grants to answer your question, the funding cuts that the school district at Goddard had, had, had uh, received uh, was about 18 percent. I believe it was but between 17 and 18 percent, which is a significant percentage cut for any business. And we are a business in a number of ways, but I would also like to point out that we are not a business in a number of ways either. And I would caution all people to think in those terms that when you think of K-12 education in the state of Kansas, it is not like any other business in this state. It is unique. There are some business aspects that are normal, but there are very many business as or aspects that what we do every day that really don't have any correlation with normal business practices. Well, I, I suppose that depends. The answer depends on what your definition of a cut is. To me, it's getting less than what you had, not less than what you would like to have. <laughs> Big difference. Um, Kansas education funding has not been cut if you measure it in terms of how has it changed over the years. Whether you count capers or not, it has set records the last few years. Records per pupil. Records. And speaking of, it'd be nice if we could all look at the same numbers. You tell me if this is an 18% cut. Here's the Goddard School funding for 2008. Total expenditures, according to the Department of Education, 49 million. 2009, 52 million. Now, somewhere in here, we're supposed to be seeing an 18 percent cut. 2010, 52.4 million. 2011, 58 million. See what happens was, and this is part of what happens all the time. You only get part of the information. Was the state funding cut? Sure, but it was backfilled with other money. The per pupil expenditure reduction in 2009 or 2010 was a whopping 2.6%. 2.6%. And the next year, 0.38%. <clears throat> Nobody decides where money goes, whether it's to the classroom or administration or anywhere else. The legislature doesn't do that. That's school boards. A couple of things you need to know about what Dave just said. First of all, in uh, two years ago, we had a general fund budget. 20 mills of that was collected at the county level. The local county collected the money, sent it to the county, they put it back to the school district. The state decided that they wanted to count that as state aid. So now my budget went from, uh, general fund budget went from 30 some million to 40 some million, an increase of over $10 million 
but I didn't get any new dollars. It's just where did the money come from? And I think that you need to realize that some of the games that Topeka sometimes plays is moving the money around, but there's not any new money. That was 35 seconds. Okay, classic straw man argument. Um, no one said that the state aid went up. I was talking about dollars. I wasn't parsing it out between state, federal, and local. The total, yes, did the state get uh, start finally, and here's how they found out. They thought they were getting credit for that 20 mills. They didn't understand in the legislature that that was considered local aid. It was according to the state formula ordered by the legislature. When Kansas Policy Institute discovered that and showed it to the legislature, they said, well, Shazam, we need to fix, it, fix that so that we're getting proper credit for the aid that the state has been providing all these years. No one said that it created an increase. It did move from one column to another. I didn't say that. That's part of the shell game that gets played trying to, defute, to, to question people, Con confuse you. I'm sorry. Thanks. We'll move now to closing comments. Two minutes each. Kevin will go first. It's been an interesting experience for me. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I'll do it again, but thank you very much. <laughs> One of the things, and, and Dave is correct in what he just said at the end, okay? It is a shell game and there are things moved around. However, at the end of the day, I have X amount of dollars to run an operational school district. The state will say we are increasing record over record over record. One of the things is, and we've talked about it before, Dave has talked about it, I've heard him in testimony, is capers. Well, what we have to remember is Capers was severely underfunded for 20 years. And Governor Brownback, to his credit, and it, Capers contributions are important. We want a strong Capers position. Nobody disagrees with that. But some of this record increase of annual increase from the state is catch up on the sins of legislatures 20 years ago that did not fund Capers to the actuaries that they were told to every year. So they're doing catch up, I get that. But that doesn't mean I have any more dollars when in the press and the governor says, we are increasing dollars significantly, I don't see it. It's not there. And if I don't get to use it to operate a school, I don't care who says it's more increased to school funding, to me it's not. To the state it is, I get that. We all want a strong capers. We all want our students to have the best possible education outcomes possible. We all want to be efficient and we all want accountability. Nobody is gonna argue that. So thank you again. I will come back. <laughs> It, it's a real shame that we didn't get a chance to talk more about the real crisis facing Kansas education, and that's the outcomes. Uh, the, the financing is, is important, uh, but just for the record, again, it is setting a record even if you don't count a penny of capers. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions in my closing remarks here. Um, Remember what we showed, 32% college ready, 20% proficient, 27% proficient. This is a, there's no right or wrong answer, but you have to answer it for yourself. Are those outcomes acceptable? And then let's look at the funding. What if, and it's interesting we couldn't get an answer, and by the way, you never get an answer of how much is enough, but what if, the schools could all get together and say, this is enough, and they got it. Here's my question. When are we going to make those outcomes acceptable? Because I can tell you this, no amount of money, just putting more money into schools or any other government entity is going to, in and of itself, change the results. We need to start focusing on the being honest about the state of achievement in Kansas and do something about that. And that means we have to put students first. The adults matter, the buildings matter, the administrators matter, but if we don't put students first, well, then they aren't first. And that's a shame. Thank you.
You know, what thrills me is both of our speakers are sincerely interested in the situation with the students, and I think that's great. Let's give them a great big hand for being here today. Let's give them a big thank you.